Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. Welcome to our program. This is part three of a very long series titled Journey Through Time, Dialogue with Great Minds from History. Uh, we have scholars and uh, highly qualified people that come uh, on this program during this series to portray someone in history. And I welcome to the program today Frederick Douglass, who lived from 1818 to 1895. Mr. Douglass was born to, as a slave in a cabin in February 1818 on the eastern shore of Maryland. At age 20, uh, he was uh, able to escape from slavery and fled to New Bedford, Massachusetts. Uh, and he was taught by uh, a, a very special person how to read and became a very famous lecturer for the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society. Uh, and he was a colleague of uh, abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison. Mr. Douglas became an advisor to President Abraham Lincoln. He was a U.S. Marshal for the District of Columbia and was Mr. Uh, Minister General to the Republic of Haiti. Mr. Douglas, welcome to our time in, uh, in um, the 21st century, and we please that you're here to talk about your life. Thank you, sir. And I'm very pleased to have our panel, uh, Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Erna Reinhardt, who is Director of Public Relations at North Idaho College, and uh, Janelle will commence today's questioning. Welcome to our time, Mr. Douglas. You had a very interesting childhood. Can you please explain to our viewers what happened during your childhood and what impact special people had on it? Oh, my first and earliest memories were the time I spent on the eastern shore uh, in Talbot County with my paternal grandparents, Isaac and Betsy Bailey. Uh, Isaac was a free man, my grandmother, uh, was a enslaved woman. Uh, my mother, Harriet, I only saw three times as a very young child. Growing up there, those first, I guess, five or six years, I had no indication that I did not belong to them until one day my grandmother said they were going to take me to some place called the Big House. And we walked about, oh, 11 or 12 miles. And when we got there, there were a number of children around and she would say, Frederick, this is your cousin and this is your brother and this is your sister. And as children uh, I want to do, we started to play and oh, maybe an hour or so later, one of the boys said, Fred, Grandma gone, Grandma gone. And I looked around and I did not see my grandmother. And I soon realized I did not belong to my grandparents, but I belonged to someone called Old Master, and it was at that time that I realized that I was in that state. Oh, it wasn't too much long after that, uh, the word came around that someone would be sent to Baltimore, and going to Baltimore was almost like going to heaven, and I went to live with the uh, brother of the man who owned me, Mr. Hugh Auld, and his uh, wife, Sophia, and their son, Tommy. And I was a company keeper for a little Tommy. And it was there that I uh, learned to read. Mrs. Sophia started to teach me, and she would read from the book of Job, I believe. And she noticed my interest, and uh, she started to teach me. And as a uh, good teacher, uh, I progress. And she told Hugh one afternoon, uh, Frederick can read. <sighs> oh my goodness, it was amazing. Uh, he told her not only was that illegal woman, but it was immoral. And I think his words were something to the effect, if you give a nigger an inch, he'll take an L. Learning, he said, will spoil the best nigger in the world. If he ever learns how to read, it will forever unfit him to be a slave. And at that moment, I knew what the secret of success would be and how I would achieve my freedom and I was determined to learn how to read. So my grandparents, my mother, though I only saw her a small time and I understood she also learned how to read, but of course the alls and as much as I hated it at the moment, I still credit Mr. Hugh in some ways with igniting that desire 
for knowledge. Erna Reinhardt. Welcome to the show, Mr. Douglas. It's Thank great you. to have you here. Talk to our viewers a little bit because a lot of us um, haven't had the life experiences that you have had. What it was like to be a slave and how long you lived in those conditions and then take us through that period of time when you escaped and then we'll talk about your, your activities with abolition. Well, I had pretty much the full range of being a slave from the best to perhaps the worst. It's often said that slavery in Maryland was not that difficult compared to some of the other states in the South, but I don't know if I would agree with that. Certainly, those years that I lived with the Alls were, were, were pleasant times. And of course, the first five or six years of my life with my grandparents were marvelous times. But there was a time when I was shipped back to uh, Tuckahoe and I was a field slave, and I was uh, uh, owned, of course, by a man named Aaron Anthony. And I lived for a year as a hired out slave to a man named Edward Covey. Covey was a, called a Negro breaker. And a young man, when he reaches a certain age, he started to feel his manhood, and he seems as though he's not going to uh, follow orders. You would be hired out. And it was the job of the slave breaker to break the spirit. And I must say, he, he pretty well broke my spirit. At one time, I thought about taking my own life. And I don't know exactly what happened, but it was one day uh, I'd gone into the uh, stable and Mr. Covey came in. And as I said in my first narrative, I, I told you how one goes about making a slave, but let me tell you now how a slave is made a man. And we had a fight, and we fought for two hours. Uh, it was defensive on my part, but after that point, I was resolved that any man who tried to whip me might as well to kill me. And so though I was a slave no more uh, in form, and was a slave in fact, but at that moment, in 1837, I decided that I would seek my freedom uh, 3 uh, September 1838. In accordance with that previous resolution, I jumped on board and exchanged my bondage uh, for my freedom, came into New York. Uh, my intended wife, Anna Murray, free woman of color at that time, came up. We were married and we went into uh, New Bedford. So I had the full range. When I was living in Baltimore, that last part, I was hired out. Uh, slave, which meant that I pretty much was controlling my own time. I would work and I would turn over the money to uh, Mr. Ald and he would give me a quarter or so. But the rest of the time I, I would do what I wanted to do and it was at that point I started to associate with a group of free Negroes. That was an organization called the East Baltimore Mental Improvement Association. Of course, it was not encouraged that someone in my state would associate it with free Negroes, but of course I could do what I wanted to do, and it was that and meeting my intended wife, Anna, that really, <coughs> excuse me, that really made the difference and I was able to escape uh, in 1838. That's a good question. As I've often said, slaves know about as much of their age as horses or cows know about theirs. Nearest I could figure, oh, I must have been maybe 19. I think I was born somewhere 18, 17, but I'm not sure. So I was 18, 19, 20 years old about that time. Mm -hmm. As you became a free person and, and you did remarkable things, one of the things that you did, you became associated with the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society and uh, also developed a professional working uh, relationship with William Lloyd Garrison. <coughs> Share some with us about, what, and you became a lecturer. And, and uh, earlier today you lectured uh, in your coming to our time in history with our uh, students at North Idaho College. Uh, such an eloquent presenter, such, such great both intellectual and spiritual uh, presentation also from the heart. Uh, give us a little bit about that experience, how you got involved with the Anti-Slavery Society and also Mr. Garrison. Oh, one of the great fortunate periods of my time. Uh, after we moved to New Bedford, uh, and New Bedford was a wonderful town. It was a place that really surrounded me and others of my state with uh, love and support and affection, so I really felt free there even though I was a fugitive. 
And I began to speak at some of the Negro churches there and was somewhat controversial because some people thought that I should not, that it was a bark of shame. I didn't figure it was my shame. And Mr. Coffin told me, this was in August of 41, that there would be a meeting out on the island of Nantucket. And I went out, and while I was there, I first caught a glimpse of William Lloyd Garrison. And I was invited to share my story, and Mr. Garrison invited me to become a paid lecturer with the Massachusetts Abolitionist Society. And I stayed with that organization for uh, several years. I left New Bedford and moved to Lynn, and in 1848, we moved to Rochester, New York. And then I began to have certain differences with William about philosophy and, and a way to proceed, and we eventually broke politically. And, and we're going to get into that. I, I found that just fascinating and learning that about your life. But when you were with the Anti-Slavery Society, you spoke throughout the, uh, the northern part of the United States. What, all, what areas did you address? Oh, we spoke uh, in New England, uh, in New York, uh, in the Midwest. Uh, after I wrote that first narrative in 45, I traveled to the British Isles, uh, England, Ireland, Scotland, and Wales. So you, were, you, you were lecturing in Europe, too. Yes, yeah. yes, I was. Uh, I was a representative, of course, of the American Anti-Slavery Society. Right. That was the British Anti-Slavery right. Society, and we were making our claims to, uh, to be the foremost society. And there was some, uh, William, and certainly my friend Wendell Phillips, thought that my life was in danger because when I wrote that uh, autobiography, I was uh, shipped over there as, as a form of protection, as a matter of fact. You know, the British, it's my understanding, abolished slavery around 1830. So when you were there, there must have been a lot of encouragement for you, and you, you must have learned a lot that you could bring back to this country as an example of ending slavery. Well, I did, of course, and of course I was still under the influence of Garrison. I, I, I came back uh, with the idea of reason. I uh, certainly came back with the idea that the churches were not doing what they thought they should be doing. As a matter of fact, there was a campaign uh, with the Scottish Church to send back the money because uh, how can you call yourself a child of Christ and support this institution? And the Southern Church was not the Church of Christ, but it was the Church of the Devil. And so we had uh, ideas about that. It was at that point I began to think seriously about other issues like temperance. And I took the temperance pledge, and uh, I saw other great speakers there. I also uh, saw life uh, in a comparative perspective. I mean, as I've often said, the, the British, uh, though they treated me quite well, they also had their niggers. Uh, <laughs> they were called Irish. And uh, some people over there live in many ways much worse than some of the slaves did. So I began to see this situation in a much wider perspective and to see how we have to cooperate, but at the same time to see how one group of people would take advantage economically, psychologically of another group of people regardless of one's color. So I began to see things uh, in a much more comparative perspective while I was over there and began to feel my own growing influence uh, as a result of interacting with the British folk. Thank you. Janelle Burke. You led a, an interesting life, as we've said before. Uh, you had some views as well as uh, on the I whole issue of women and oh, what yes. the role of women should be. Mm. Can you share that with our viewers, please? Oh, indeed. It was, uh, oh, July of 48. I got a, a message from my dear friend Elizabeth Cady Stanton that there would be a meeting at Seneca Falls, New York. So I left Rochester to cover that meeting as a journalist. And Elizabeth did something that uh, no one would agree to, uh, very few people. She read her declarations of sentiment, which said that women should have all the rights as men, including the right to vote. And she said, I looked over and I saw you, Frederick, and I called on you. I second that motion, and it passed. Of course, I have to give credit to uh, Elizabeth. Going back when she was a, a dear woman, she radicalized me. 
uh, I had the same opinion as most men. I thought that the, that the proper sphere for a woman was in the domestic arena, and each time I would cite an example as to why women should not be in the public area, she'd cut me to the quick. And I've come around to that, and since that point, I was always proud to call myself a woman's rights man. As a matter of fact, my newspaper, The North Star, was dedicated to the cause of the bondsmen and women as well. And did you know Sojourner Truth? Oh, indeed. I know and knew Sojourner Truth. Uh, uh, we've had our differences. Uh, in 1870, when I thought that the 15th Amendment should be the amendment to give black men the right to vote, I said, this is the black man's hour. Sojourner thought it should be universal franchise to give women the right to vote. She once posed a question in public, Frederick, is God dead? I said, well, I don't <laughs> think so, Sojourner, <laughs> but she challenged to me, yes, yes. Arthur Reinhardt. You spoke a little bit earlier about your relationship with William Lloyd Garrison, and he was your mentor for many, many yes. years. But then you did, the two of you went down uh, different paths. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about the differences, what, uh, what he believed in and, and what you believed in, and those differences. Well, there were several principles that all Garrisonians uh, agreed to agree to. One was the Constitution was a pro-slavery document and therefore one should not be engaged in organized politics and a government organized under that constitution. Two, that the church was a pro-slavery institution. And three, that moral suasion should be the strongest method that one should go about to overthrow the system. After I started to read the Constitution, the text itself, I could see no indication that it was pro-slavery. As a matter of fact, the Constitution doesn't mention slavery. It, it, it alludes to it mentioned free and unfree, but at the time it was written, there were free blacks and unfree whites. So it was not necessarily, uh, in my mind, pro-slavery, but it's been interpreted that way. Two, well... The church, and going back to my experience in England and certain northern churches, are not pro-slavery. Now, unquestionably, the Methodist church, say, for instance, when you look at their general uh, 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 meeting in 1797, it was unquestionably anti-slavery. But each time they would meet thereafter, it became more and more pro-slavery. And what was happening? It was the people in the church, and as the Methodist church ceased to be an outside church and became a dominant church, replacing churches like the Episcopalian and the Presbyterian church, it started to reflect the sentiment of the people. And so, therefore, I came to the conclusion that it wasn't Christianity, but it was the way that particular church was interpreted. Certainly, the Quakers were not pro-slavery, nor were the Unitarians. And so we disagreed with that. And in 1848, I met another man who had a great influence on me, and that was the late John Brown. And John convinced me, and certainly when the Fugitive Slave Bill passed in 1850, it would take something much stronger than moral suasion. If it took something stronger than moral suasion to free uh, this country from the British, uh, King George didn't listen to moral suasion. And the war uh, thereafter, it was uh, something longer and stronger than moral suasion. Uh, the Mexican War, longer than moral suasion. The American way is that if you are a man, you fight for your freedom. And so therefore, when the war of the rebellion was declared and I had the opportunity to recruit for black men to fight for our freedom, I did so. Well. Garrison uh, disagreed with those positions and we eventually split. And one other thing as well, when I decided I wanted my own uh, newspaper and I was offered a position to write for the American Anti-Slavery Standard, which I did, but no, I wanted my own organ. They felt that it could not succeed. I felt as though it could. And then other things became sort of personal and bitter. Uh, my association with people like Judy Griffith and others. And so we went from the political to the personal and it just sort of got mm, unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> After your death and um, coming into the 20th century, there would be a, another remarkable leader by the name of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And he would have a, 
a moral compass and moral persuasion approach in nonviolence, but there were others in the civil rights movement in the 20th century that disagreed with him and they were more militant in, in their actions. So my point I'm trying to make uh, with you, Mr. Douglas, is that not only in your time, but in a future time, there would also be those philosoph philosophical differences as to strategy to bring about change, in this case, segregation. I want to go back and talk about the Constitution a minute with you. Uh, even though the word slave or slavery is not in the original Constitution, in four places in the Constitution, it certainly makes it clear that there is a difference between free and non-free. In fact, one section indicates that if a non-free person flees from a plantation and goes north, that person must be brought back to uh, their owner, it really said. So I, I guess one can have a play on words, but really basically the Constitution uh, and the Southerners made sure that happened at the Constitutional Convention that they were going to have uh, the concept of slavery. In the Dred Scott case in uh, 1856 uh, reaffirmed that. So it took a civil war and a new amendment. So let me, now that you can look back on all of that, uh, was the difference between you and William Lloyd Garrison in relation to those, uh, did it become more personality or were these really major uh, disagreements on, uh, you've, already, you've been very eloquent talking about the moral persuasion was not enough, but let's go back to the constitutional question. Oh, it was definitely uh, uh, philosophical and political. Certainly when I moved to uh, Rochester and started to interact with people like uh, Susan B. Anthony and Jared Smith, I mean, we're talking about power, and power is politics. And if one does not engage in all strata of power, you weaken your cause. And so for that reason, as a matter of practical principle, it seemed to me I had to get engaged in organized politics. And again, Garrison disagreed with that. So it wasn't just a personal something, it, but it was strategic and it was political. My final question, thank you. My final mm -hmm. question before going back to the panel would be, you had a real impact. There's mm. no question that uh, history has recorded and, and honored you that as an abolitionist. But also William Lord Garrison is also um, credited in history of being a very powerful speaker. Mm -hmm. and as equally passionate as you about oh, doing yes. away with slavery. So I guess my question is that can people have somewhat a disagreement or, or somewhat different ways of approaching something, but they both impact in a very significant, important way in bringing positive change? Oh, without question. Uh, William was a major figure, a ma major figure in my personal life. Uh, I disagreed with many uh, black figures, Henry Howland Garnett, you mentioned Sojourner Truth, uh, Harriet Tutman and I were on the same side, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony and I were on different sides in terms of the vote, uh, the Mott sisters and I were on the same side. So each person has to work it out among themselves. Uh, you organize and you work with those like you, but ultimately, as Americans, when we make the decision that law would be supreme, we eventually sit down and we compromise, and that is uh, the system. Now, what's unique about this system, it says that if you reach a point where you can't work it out, then it is your duty to overthrow that system that's keeping you in bondage. And so we had to overthrow that system militarily, but that is also a part of our system. And so we got both things working in this country. Hopefully, the Civil War uh, said we are one nation. But if we ever reached a point again where there are people so oppressed, then I think they will make that decision in their own time, in their own place, in their own way but that's also a part of the American system. Janelle Burke. At a point in time, you met Abraham Lincoln. Hmm. Can you tell us how you met him, what brought you together, and then what was your role with regard to him? I met him the first time uh, the war, people thought the war would be over relatively quickly. And I was quite concerned when my friend, Governor John Andrew of uh, Massachusetts, got the uh, order from Secretary of War Stanton that uh, we could recruit uh, black troops. And I was given the opportunity to, to recruit the Massachusetts 54th Regiment, eventually the Massachusetts 50, uh, 5th Regiment. 
And my uh, friend, uh, Senator Pomeroy from Kansas, set up that meeting. And I met with the president to talk about certain issues, for instance, that black troops were not paid the same as white troops. They had to buy their own uniform. Uh, we were getting word that the uh, southern uh, soldiers and officers said that if they caught a black soldier, they would either execute him or put him in slavery and that there were no members of blacks who were part of the officer class. And I wanted to express our opinion, not just my opinion, to the president to correct that. I thought that if they put our boys to death, we should put theirs to death. Well, the president didn't agree with that, but he understood my point. Second time I met with the president, uh, well, uh, the war was proceeding on. The Emancipation Proclamation had been issued. And the president wanted me to go behind the enemy lines, go south, and work with uh, General Lorenzo Thomas to encourage blacks to revolt behind Union lines. And I thought it was rather amusing that uh, the commander in chief wanted me to do something that John Brown had been hanged for wanting to do, but I agreed. <laughs> Unfortunately, my commission uh, as a major never came through, so I figured that discretion was the better part of valor and I was not going to go south as a civilian, so that did not happen. But I did recruit my first two recruits with my, my two boys, two of my, my three boys. The last time I saw the president was on the day of his second inaugural. A lady friend and I had gone from the inaugural and walked down to the receiving line and we were waiting for the president and several uh, people before I got to him, the president looked up and said, ah, here's my friend Frederick Douglass, loud that, enough. On that note, I have to bring the conclusion <laughs> that the clock always went on this program. Oh. Uh, Frederick Douglass has been our guest who lived from 1818 to 1895. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, Mr. Frederick Douglass has been portrayed um, on this program by Charles Everett Pace, who holds uh, degrees in uh, biology and in American studies and history and anthropology in Purdue University. Uh, at Purdue University where he received one of those degrees in the University of Texas, the other one, uh, and he's taught at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln at Purdue University and at Central College in Kentucky. Um, he's a remarkable scholar and I, I'm sure that you agree with us that it's been a marvelous journey through time today uh, dealing with the life of Frederick Douglass uh, who was a remarkable uh, influential person in the abolitionist movement uh, that succeeded with the uh, through the Civil War of abolishing slavery and the addition of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution. Um, again, I would like to say in character, Mr. Frederick Douglass, thank you for being with us and, uh, and coming to our time uh, to interview uh, on this journey through time. Thank Ladies and sure. gentlemen, we'll be with you again next week in part four on our journey through time. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music